morning. Good morning. I'm Brian Durkin, and I will be your liturgist today. We are glad you are worshiping with us today, whether you are online or here in the sanctuary. We welcome back Reverend Dr. Z. Allen Abbott, who will be preaching today. Michelle Chenevere will provide us with special music, and our organist is Elizabeth Jeffries. We do have a few announcements this morning. Those who are in charge of the Christmas affair groups and anyone who would like to be involved there will be a meeting immediately following worship in the library cafe today. Kickoff Sunday will be September 8th, and there will be a pancake breakfast at 9 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. JMPC will be upgrading our sound, screen, and streaming technology and software over the next two weeks. And we hope to have it all ready for kickoff Sunday on September 8th. In an effort to best prepare for the change, we will have a church service run-through on September 7th at 10 a.m. This is all in quotes, church service run-through. This run-through is open to anyone, and this is also in quotes, count as church attendance for the week. Though we would be happy to see you on Sunday as well for the pancake breakfast and kickoff service. These and all the announcements can be found on our website at www.johnmcmillanpc.org. Please rise for the passing of the peace. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pass the peace of Christ to each other. Please join me in the call to worship. Who has gathered this day in the sanctuary of the Lord? We, the sheep of the pasture, and the people of God have come. Why have you come, O people of God? We have come to worship the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In what spirit have you come? Let us worship God.
confession. Our God is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. God is close to all who call on God in truth, listening to their cries for help and offering them salvation. So let's bring our confession to God, knowing that he will hear our prayers and forgive. O Christ, who prayed for us, died for us, and lives for us, you taught us that we bring home to you, and your words are our truth. Forgive us, O Lord, when we live as if we belong only to ourselves. Forgive us, O Lord, when we foolishly think that power is the ultimate truth. Speak your words of peace to us this day, and make our lives a testimony to your grace. For you are the source of life itself, and only in you can we truly live. The psalmist wrote, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. Friends, this is the good news for you and me. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. We come now to a time of prayer, and as I temporarily lead us all in prayer, I invite you also to join me as we pray together the words of the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Please bow with me. God, as we continue in a spirit of prayer, we are grateful. We are grateful for the beautiful morning and the beauty of this past week, the taste of the autumn which is soon to come. We show our gratitude for the many blessings that you bestow upon us, blessings of strength and labor, blessings material, blessings spiritual, and blessings familial. We're reminded that, as you told our father Abraham, that we are blessed to be a blessing and that a generous person will be enriched and one who gives will also receive. In this spirit we have received, so let us also give. And now please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Everything's going to work out just fine. Everything's going to be all right. It's been all wrong. And I can see the light of a clear blue morning. I can see the light of a brand new day. I can see the light of a clear blue morning. Oh, everything's gonna be all right. It's gonna be okay. It's been a long, long time since I've known the taste of freedom. And those the clinging vines that held me down, well, I don't need them. I was like captured eagle you know an eagle is a born to fly now that I have won my freedom like an eagle I am eager for the sky cause I can see I can see the light of a brand new day. I can see the light of a clear blue morning. Oh, everything's gonna be all right. It's gonna be okay. And I can see the light of a clear blue morning. I can see Thank you. Now I have to follow that. Thank you. Mm. You know, it's an honor to be invited to speak here today. And it's a double honor that I spoke here once already. So being invited back is something that I am humbled by. Thank you very much. Our message today is called Helpful Handfuls from the Harvest. And it's from the book of Ruth, chapter 2. Pause for just a moment to prepare our hearts for God's word. Lord, every week we are reminded of the amazing responsibility that we have to hear the word from each other, to hear your word through each other, and to receive new insights that will lead us through the week as we seek to serve you and honor you. Let this be the moment. Open our ears and open our hearts and our minds, we pray. Amen. Our text comes from the familiar story of Ruth. And just as a little brush up reminder, let me tell you the context. There was a husband and wife from Israel, and in order to leave a famine in the land, they went to the other side of the Dead Sea to what is now called Jordan. Back then, it was a country called Moab. And they had a couple of sons while they were over there. Those sons grew up and married Moabite women, and they were a wonderful family until tragedy struck. Just like every good story, you've got to start with some kind of a tragedy. 
And within a short period, all three of the males in the story, the, the husband and the two sons, died, leaving the three women as widows. And so, the mother, Naomi, turns to her two daughters-in-law and says, I'm going back over to Bethlehem, over to Israel, to be with my family. You all have been blessed, excuse me, blessed and released, and you are free to find new husbands for yourself. Well, one of them says, thank you, thank you, I'm going to do that, I'm going to stay right here, I hate to see you go. The other one, named Ruth, says, no, I am going to follow you back home. And that's where our story picks up. In Ruth, the second chapter, we read, Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Eli Melech, is how it's pronounced, whose name was Boaz. Well, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I might find favor. And so she said to her, Go, my daughter. And so she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. And as it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. And just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Well, then Boaz said, his young man who was in charge of the reapers, to whom does this woman belong? And the young man who was in charge of the reapers answered, well, she's the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came and she's been here on her feet from early morning until now without resting for even a moment. So then Boaz says to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I've ordered the young men not to bother you, and if you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young, women, or what the young men have drawn. And so Boaz instructed this young man, his young men, rather, let her glean even among the standing sheaves and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls for her from the bundles and leave them for her to glean and do not rebuke, them, re rebuke her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in this culture, the indigent were encouraged, allowed, they, they would follow the harvesters into the field and they would pick up whatever they needed to sustain themselves, as we see so dramatically here in the book of Ruth. <clears throat> this is when the widow Ruth, a resident alien, by the way, goes out into Boaz's fields and spoiler alert, not only is she going to find all the food that she needs, she's eventually going to find a new husband. It's a happy ending to a familiar story. So the opening question that I put before us today is, where do you have a surplus in your life? Now you all know that the relationship that I have with this church is through your pastor. Pastor Jeff is the chair of the board of an organization that I lead, the Baptist Homes Foundation. And it's this organization's job to raise millions of dollars per year to provide for the needs of older adults here in the South Hills. And often I am asked, how did I get started in philanthropy? Well, you see on the screen, you remember this scene from Forrest Gump? Don't you just love the doctor with the cigarette hanging out of his mouth? <laughs> when I was a little boy, about two and a half years old, I had that same apparatus on my legs. I had come down with a disease called leg calva pertus, 
where the, the ball at the top of the thigh bone that snaps into the pelvis disintegrates, okay? And we didn't know exactly how to cure it except through therapy and, and a lot of prayer. And my parents were dirt poor. We couldn't afford that kind of medical treatment, but a local foundation paid for my health care. And so they sent me, along with some of the other handicapped children, around town. This was in Chattanooga, where I grew up. And we would go out to the wishing wells where people would make coin donations. And I would go on to television, on the local news, and I would be at all of these types of games. That's me over there, sitting with the guy with the white socks and the uh, short tie and the stubby cigar in his mouth. <laughs> and you can see how happy I am to be with him. <laughs> and every now and then, I would be rolled out onto the stage of the Tivoli Theater in Chattanooga for the annual telethon. And I was told, you look into the camera with the little red light. And I would say, hello, everybody. My name is Alan. And I would start singing a song, or I would quote poetry, or I would quote Bible verses or something. And I realized that there was a scoreboard over my shoulder. And the cuter I was, the faster that scoreboard would move, <laughs> tracking the donations that were coming in. But that was also where I first understood the relationship between money and mission. You see, the more money, the more mission can be done. It's pretty simple how that works. And so that story has followed me all throughout my life. And when I was preparing today's message, something jumped out to me about this passage of scripture. It's not charity we're talking about. In fact, the concept of charity doesn't appear anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. It's about justice. The whole concept of loving your neighbor is not about charity. It's about justice. Now, Pastor Jeff just finished a series of sermons on the Ten Commandments, and thank you for putting those online, live, and recorded. I learned a lot. I'm sure you did, too. But those are just the top ten. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, by some counts, there are 613 commandments. And the story of Ruth embodies the commandments from Leviticus chapter 19. Let me read to you just a couple of those passages. In verses 9 and 10, it says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. In those two verses, there are four commandments, and they're the, what we might call a negative commandments, the thou shalt not type commandments, just things don't do this. Don't harvest your field all the way to the corners. Do not glean the things that, have fall, that, that fall to the ground. When you're working in your vineyards, don't exhaustively harvest. Don't take every single grape. Leave some for others. And those which fall on the ground, leave them there. Leave, refrain, don't reap, don't pick, don't strip it bare. Refrain from interfering with God doing justice for the poor. Hmm. The poor and the stranger, in God's eyes, have a divine claim to that food. That's their food. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything and everyone that is in it. We're not talking about a handout. We're not talking about people needing to help themselves because if we take all the food away, then they can't help themselves. They are entitled to it. It's not the prerogative of the farmer. The landowner is not giving these crops. See, that's a big difference that we sometimes lose in the idea of charity today. 
There's no farm too small, no vineyard too small. Apparently, every landowner can afford to spare a little. The landowner returns a portion to God in a sacrifice, usually at the temple, or eventually in the synagogue, eventually in the church. And God distributes a portion to the poor, and then the landowner can claim the rest for themselves. The principle is this, a caring, interdependent community is more important than our property rights. Because ultimately, God owns everything. Everything we have, we received by God's grace. And God expects us to use those gifts to care for one another. Notice, we haven't said a word yet about money, right? We're talking about food, property. In God's eyes, rich and poor are equal. God is the one who is distributing and taking care of us all. Yes, it's about money eventually, but it's also about our time, our talent, and all our treasures. The concept, again, is justice, not charity. One time I was in Los Angeles on a business trip, <clears throat> and my colleague pointed out that all around town there are trees, fruit trees, available for the picking by the homeless and the poor. Fruit trees that have apples and pears and oranges, of course. And that is one way that the city tries to provide for its indigent population. That's justice. That's not charity. In charity, think about it, a giver, a donor makes a gift. They do it voluntarily surrendering something without exchange. And the donor exercises all discretion as to what they will give, when they will give it, how they will give it, and usually to whom they will give it. The donor has all the agency in charity. Justice does not have any of those traits. Justice preserves the dignity of the recipient. The gleaners remain anonymous. And to ignore these commandments the Bible says, is like stealing from God. The prophet Isaiah said, in Isaiah 3, verses 14 and 15, it's you who have devoured the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. <coughs> Excuse me. And then in Proverbs chapter 22, we also read that to steal from the poor is stealing from God. And God will make it right. Let me tell you a story. I told you I grew up in Chattanooga. You're familiar with the song, the Chattanooga Choo Choo, from a long time ago. And it's about, and it's about a train that goes from New York City, from Pennsylvania Station, at a quarter to four. You read a magazine and then you're in Baltimore, and it ends up down in Chattanooga, right? Great wartime story, catchy tune, not true at all. The Chattanooga Choo Choo was the first rail link between the North and the South following the Civil War. It was a train line that ran from Chattanooga to Cincinnati, Ohio. And that train line was still in operation when I was a kid, and my mom and dad used to put me on the train in Chattanooga wearing my cute little conductor hat and those pinstripe overalls and sit me right on seat number one and send me off to Cincinnati because that's where my grandparents lived. And in fact, my grandmother worked at Union Terminal, the train station in Cincinnati. And so she would coordinate it to where she would finish her shift right when the train from Chattanooga would arrive She'd go downstairs, meet me as I step off the train, and I'd go spend part of my summer with Grandma and Grandpa. 
Oh, there's a part of the story I didn't tell you. As soon as the train would leave the station in Chattanooga, I would hop out into the center aisle and turn around and look at everybody and say, hello, everybody. My name is Alan. Today, we're going to have church. And all those passengers looked at this crazy little six-year-old kid and thinking, what on earth? And I would start pretending I'm in church because that was my whole world. I would say, okay, let's all turn in our hymnals and sing, Jesus loves me. And I'd start leading them, Jesus, and sure enough, people start joining in. They'd have to sing along. What else are they going to do? They've got a three or four hour train ride in front of them, right? Jesus loves me. And then I would pretend to preach. I would give it my best Billy Sunday and Billy Graham wave of the hand. And I would pretend that I was telling them John 3.16. And then I would take off my cap and say, it's time for the offering. <laughs> and up and down the aisle, the row, I would go. People tossing in quarters and sometimes paper money, you know. This was a great train ride for me because that was how I could buy my baseball cards all summer. <laughs> and one time I got off the train in Cincinnati, my grandma met me, and I apparently had done so well, I couldn't help but tell her that story, and I showed her all that money, and she said, you can't keep that. That's God's money. And I said, nope, I earned it. <laughs> she sat me down and she taught me, you give 10% to the Lord. You put 10% in the bank. And the rest is up to you. How we look at the things that we have is based on our perspective of where it came from. Leviticus 19 eventually became the basis for religious practices governing our obligations to the poor, which evolved into how we deal with economic and social circumstances, it eventually gave the basis for providing a daily distribution of food for those in immediate need of it, as well as a weekly distribution of money for those who required long-term assistance. And every effort was made to preserve the dignity of those who received charity, but rooted in justice. Leviticus 19, by the way, you remember it's the very same chapter where we get the golden rule. This is where love your neighbor as yourself comes from. And all throughout that chapter, when it talks about the word neighbor, it's referring to people socially and relationally, not just geographically and literally. Throughout this chapter, the neighbor is defined as the poor, the stranger, the sojourner, your fellow citizens, laborers, the deaf, the blind, the rich your family, and your fellow citizens. <clears throat> and just as last week when Pastor Jeff spoke from Mark chapter 12, he told the story that when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He replied, the first is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your strength and the second is this you shall love your neighbor as yourself no commandment greater than these love is not an emotional or mental attitude it's simply acting in a way that reflects God and eventually this became the whole basis for a just society Regular members of the community were taxed a certain amount to help provide for those who are in need so that we might be able to maintain communal institutions. 
But beyond that minimum requirement, everyone was still encouraged to supplement that minimum with generous voluntary contributions, just like Boaz, who went way beyond the requirement and cheerfully provided for Ruth. And that's where philanthropy was born. Philanthropy simply comes from two Greek words, phileo and anthropos. Love, that's where we get like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, and anthropology, the love of humanity. In other words, as it's stated in the New Testament, love one another. So the final question that I have for you Where do you have an abundance in your life? How will you share it with those who need it? Jesus said that we are to love the one God with all our heart, soul, and strength, and that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. This is the summary of the Ten Commandments, which we accept as a gift from God and commit to follow. We bring our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings to God because we have received them from God's generous hand. We return thanks so that our gifts and our lives may be of service to God.
praise and thank you, Lord God, for the majesty of your work, the wisdom of your word, and the generosity of your grace. Let the gifts of our lives bear witness to your goodness and mercy, your faithfulness and justice, and your steadfast love for all. Amen. Please remain standing and receive our benediction. In Deuteronomy 16, we are reminded, justice, justice, you shall pursue. And in Psalm 112, verse 5, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. And may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May God cause his countenance to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen.